Uh, good morning, all luxury people. Um, uh, this is a story I'm going to tell you about called Moisier, and uh, it's in the luxury goods kind of world. But about 10 or 12 years ago, the luxury good, goods kind of world in this for this kind of drink turned from uh, what we would think was uh, upmarket, chic, you know, connoisseurship, etc. Actually, the two the beginning of 2000, the whole world went from luxury to what I would call bling. Now, for the French, that was a bit of a tricky one to, to get a hold of, but uh, bling is what I'm going to talk, talk to you about. I'm an advertising marketing guy and a creative director. I've got a lot of uh, experience in luxury brands. Uh, some things like uh, Range Rover, Chiga, which are a posh Italian uh, hotel chain, and Private Bank. Uh, for HSBC and some other stuff they have. So I get to talk to a lot of people who, who are in this kind of world and what, what they want and how they perceive their world and how they perceive their persona. I've also worked uh, in the drinks industry quite a lot uh, for spirits, for uh, beers and for waters. I've done everything from Perrier Jouet to uh, Perrier the Water. So I understand how people perceive very similar products but they always need to know what is slightly better about that, why is that one more luxury, and why is that more prestige. So I understand that a lot. I'm going to talk about a great product called Boisier with a really good history. It's two centuries old or, or more. Uh, it's, uh, it's distilled and uh, made in Jarnac in France. And, uh, and they've been doing great for 200 years. But as soon as they got in America, about 10 or 12 years ago, they've had uh, a, a really good market of old school American. Uh, American uh, drinkers and uh, being associated with someone like Napoleon always went down very well with these high end sort of people. But uh, by the beginning of 2000 here, the, uh, this one point brand was hitting a bit of a, a bit of a brick wall because uh, the market and the type of drinks that people were trying to consume were into new kind of brands. And the world, and certainly in America at the time, was changing from uh, dark spirits to we call brown spirits to uh, white spirits. Brands like uh, Belvedere, Grey Goose, Tanqueray 10, Absolute, and uh, Bombay Sapphire. And a lot of these were being made from the authentic uh, drinks houses of, uh, of Europe. And the US had a, a great market for cognacs, but these drinks start looking a bit old school, so it's just not fashionable. And one of the difficulties for a brown spirit like Pogwazia is that it takes about 10 years to make one. You know, you get grapes, you make the stuff, you put it in the cellar for at least 10 years, you blend it up and then you can start selling it. But these guys, yeah, you can make them in a month. You can make, make this, you invent something, make it in a month, have fantastic modern packaging, bring it on the market, say it's the latest thing, but it will be done to very, very high standards. So instead of just being in stock vodka markets, like the high-end vodka market, have to compete with 10-year-old, 20-year-old, uh, drinks that, uh, that take a lot of effort to make. So, the other thing about it was uh, this kind of connoisseurship was actually losing its uh, uh, chicness and it was also losing its mojo. It was, it was, it was less losing its sex appeal. And this, at the time, was uh, the, what Colbazia had been selling itself on was through the, 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 the uh, association with the European elite and the wasps of America. You know, these are the kind of people that drank cold was here, and they told you they've defined uh, what the contemporary and uh, historic uh, you know, prestige was. Uh, but they were dated. Not only that, these kind of people were dying out, physically dying out. And the problem with that was a bit like uh, we, when we found in America, it was a bit like pitching uh, Johnny Halliday against Guns N' Roses. There was no contest, you know, who was going to win this fight. So, uh, we um, we knew you can take some old school stuff and actually reinvent it. It's done all the time. And all you, all you guys are working for luxury goods know that know that, that that happens because even luxury goods have within themselves an inherited quality. It's just how it's packaged, how it's perceived, how it's redesigned, and how it's represented. And uh, Burberry itself has always been a great product where it's been very very old old-fashioned English heritage, but then you can actually go super modern. With not too much effort, you can actually do that, as long as you attempt to do that position, the product, that kind of stuff. Now, in the US, 
we were looking at the US for what was the, the new prestige, who's making the waves, who's actually defining what modern culture was, and who was actually defining what prestige was. I said it was, it was bling, but in the US, the thing that was the, to, uh, driving culture that time was this new outburst of hip hopness. Hip hopness was took up rock and roll and so all country western, all that kind of stuff. It actually became the new currency for uh, brand identity. And within hip hop, uh, there was a new emerging uh, 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 bunch of people who can uh, take that stage and make things happen. Now, as a, obviously, as we're, in, we're a, a ad company, we, we started looking at uh, the matrix of, of, of who was drinking what, what was possible. In the States, uh, you know, you, you have most of America, white America, uh, but you had a, two of the defined markets, uh, black market and Hispanic market. Now, the uh, Hispanic market, uh, we looked at them, they tend to drink tequilas and white rums, so they didn't have the taste for a brown spirit. Black market uh, had a very good uh, uh, taste for uh, whiskies and bourbon, so they, they were, were just an easier target to actually work on. So we went there, found that these people were an easier target to work on that because they had the actual uh, flavour of a brown spirit within it in their repertoire, so we thought we'll go and find them. And uh, we were working at Bates Agency, I was running Alain Demek at the time as a creative director, crunched the numbers and went up to see up the States to meet all these people, have a chat, find out what's going on, go to the clubs, go to the bars, go to where they buy and how they drink it at home, etc. And uh, we thought, uh, yeah, these guys are really impressive, you know, they've got a big new wave of black entrepreneurs, they were very successful in media, fashion, uh, there were artists, there were in the service industries, everything was going great for them. And uh, we thought, wow, you know, these are the new aristocracy of uh, fashion. They were so aristocratic, aristocratic these people, that they even had their own prints. Yeah? <laughs> now this uh, new elite was successful, not only attacking the aspect of the peers, but also we knew, by doing a bit of research around the world as well, was that they were influences of uh, other Americans, European trendsetters and Asian trendsetters. So, okay, that was a good market for us to get into the States, but we knew that that would sort of waft onto the rest of other people who think, wow, the, the, these these are really uh, current people, uh, that's good for those guys, well, we'll have a bit of that as well. So we knew that, uh, even just talking about what is this, a big segment, that that segment would uh, also have influence on other segments. A bit like Richard Sanders. When you go for one bunch of people, does that affect how the other bunch of people uh, 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 act? And we knew that would happen as well. So, we intended to take Corvoisier from something that was being seen not very good anymore uh, to being coming bad. But in bad, uh, in hip hop language, that bad is good. Yeah? So, we, went, we decided our goodness would go badness. Uh, and as an advertising group, we knew how to engage in, in these people. We also knew that us, you know, a bunch of white guys in West London, uh, we're not going to cut it here, so we'll, we'll just down tools and we'll go back to America and find out the people who, who know how to talk to these people, who had respect of, uh, of, uh, of uh, the, the hip hop world. And uh, for us and for us, we wanted to get the core and essence of this market and work with the talents in that community. Because we knew that to build uh, an endorsed thing, that uh, you need interaction with the people who are you who are you trying to to uh, get on your side. We want to build a long term relationship. So what we did, we uh, were smart. We had enough people there that tell us stuff, and we uh, we uh, allied with this uh, organisation called D Rush. D Rush was a, a black uh, ad agency, promotion agency, talent agency. Uh, uh, but run by this guy Russell Simmons, who had uh, D Rush as the agency, he also had Def Jam Records. He was Mr. B. He was fantastic. And the great thing about him, he was very open to new uh, ways to uh, promote things. He had massive respect uh, in, the, in the States and the black community for music, but also in the business community. Everybody thought, this guy, he knows what he's doing. So it was a double, double whammy, really. Great in music, good in sort of culture but also seen as a, 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 a cute uh, business person. So we start talking about what we could do with Corvoisier. And Corvoisier, even though it's, we've all probably heard of it, it's not a gigantic, massive brand. It's not huge amounts of money. So whatever I had to do 
we couldn't just buy our way into the market. We just had to associate with the market and get it, get the sweet spot really, really uh, tight. And we could have done in a normal way. We could have done a bit of sponsorship. We could have put up T-shirts so you could add a let's see Miami beach party every now and again. That was for the Miami beach parties, but uh, we, we went the other way. Uh, now we realised that these trend setters that believed in ownership of a brand didn't just want to be associated or didn't want to shelf, but actually want to be part of it and actually be able to manipulate how it's been used and to give a greater depth and credence to the brand. As Corbusier for this new market, there's no history, historic reference about who the earth back Napoleon is. They don't give a damn. You know, he's just a French dude. They want to know what it was in for them. And it was For them, it was a connoisseurship, knowing a good brand uh, from a bad brand, an authentic brand from a sort of uh, ersatz brand. And... Uh, we, could, we, 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 we wanted to get away from just the pure uh, celebrity endorsement. I know we've talked about celebrity endorsements and from some people you get the right person to present stuff that's great and they even get people to come around your factory and do all that kind of stuff. You've got to get them involved. And everybody knew that's what you wanted to do. You had to get some endorsement that was true rather than just a, hey, that's next to George Clooney. Where's the coffee gone? You know. So, um, Russell Simmons, he said he, he's one of his best boys, will get this guy called Buster Rhymes, top rapper, to uh, come and do something for us. And for not a very lot of money, him and Buster got together, and uh, Buster Rhymes uh, wrote the first sort of big endorsed uh, rap song uh, called Pass the Corbusier. I'll just give you a little teeny weeny sample, I'll play the, a bit more of a longer version of, what do I watch on? Longer version at the end. Where, where it talks about passing the gold was, yeah? So it's just, this, you know, it's hip hop stuff. <laughs> Now I'm going to play, play it a bit later. It takes a while to get to the bus past the Corbusier bit. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, he, uh, Buster did this uh, this track. Uh, and he also did it later did a remix with Pharrell Williams and P Diddy. It was in an album called Genesis and eventually a single as well. And uh, you know we we liked it. And our American uh, distributor thought, fantastic, this is great as well. But our French guys thought, oh my God, what we're going to do here? And that's 200 <laughs> years down the drain, you know. 200 years down the drain. And uh, when we used to sing, we just used to play the opening. We used to play the opening. Oh, we've got this hip-hop stuff. Play the opening, then walk out the room and all that. But um, obviously when they, uh, they got a bit shaky, especially when they found a, a sample of the lyrics. So there's a lot of this uh, girls with swollen asses and niggas possibly their corbois. So they, they didn't get what's going to happen. But as I said, um, it was authentic. It was all involved. It was all for the real deal. Done by the real people uh, at the time. And Farrah Williams and uh, you know P. Diddy, going into this world at the time, were just right at the beginning. You really had to know what was going on to understand, well, these are the top guys are going to change uh, uh, history here in American music history. So being right at the beginning of the crest of the wave, that was, we got credence by saying, well, these know, people know how to spot the next big trend. And the reason why was, that was good as well was that it started working, it started working, it got in the, in the club. And it was quite difficult uh, even promoting this stuff because uh, a lot of urban music wasn't even on mainstream radio or mainstream TV or MTV, you know, stuff that's going in the MTV world. And a lot of stuff wouldn't be played or wouldn't be shown. So we had to use this by going into where people hang out, where they do their own music, etc. Uh, to do this. Now, uh, this uh, track that Buster did actually got to number 11 in the US Billboard, you know, which is no mean feat for people are an urban uh, act at the time. And uh, it also started giving us crossover exposure in the clubs and the bars and stuff like that. And eventually, Core Boys started halt the slide of its, of its sales increase the market share and critically increase price premium because at the time when, when a 
Brand gets a bit uh, sad in America. They just start slashing the prices to keep them. The, the uh, retailers have to take the hit on just the volume shifted and not on the price premium because we work with the premium people doing premium sort of shows to do that. And the feedback from the bars and clubs and retailers yeah, listen, love the authenticity and love the boldness of it. And that's what we've got on. We've got great press, we've got great endorsement, very good uh, uh, you know, feedback. Now, other, other clients, other, other sort of uh, uh, distillers in the States, uh, other rivals, thought, well, that's a piece of piss. We can do that. You know, we'll, we'll just get this guy here. We'll get two pack. We'll give him a bottle of this stuff. Hennessy, we'll give him Hennessy, get him to write a load of this hip hop stuff, see what goes on. So when Tupac uh, wrote, wrote this track on uh, behalf of Hennessy, uh, they thought they ticked all the boxes, you know, he's a big deal there, uh, tough rapper, he's got the bottle of Hennessy, he's having a good time with nights out with girls and stuff like that. But everybody by that time recognised this was just a copy. Cole Bosier, that's the real deal, that's authentic, that's, the, that's somebody's put a bit of time in after. This is just a copy, this is it, uh, is that. And the thing about that was that everybody understood that on a prestige product, it has to be super real, it has to be the one. Anything else is just, uh, you know, it's, it's a sort of Chinese ripoff, really. Uh, and, uh, you know, when you do pay your premium price, you want the, you want the premium product, and premium people around it, premium association. Everything like that. Now, the thing about that is, uh, as, as I said, uh, Tupac, you know, he's dead now, I don't know why. Uh, but, uh, but, uh, Borsa Rhymes and Cobras succeeded, succeeded because they were authentic. I mean, authentic it was an authentic uh, drink, 200 years old, it was, you know, managed well, etc. It was authentically brought to a consumer. It was bold, it didn't just say, oh, we can just push it a little bit more, we'll, we'll change it. You know, they've changed the sort of packaging a wee bit, we'll, we'll do this. No, they actually went bold. They thought, we'll stand out, we'll be strong. It's prestige people are, are, you know, noble people. They can stand out and uh, do that. But also became part of the language. We didn't just say, bottle of uh, uh, Cogwazi here, person here. We actually linked them in, coming up the mouths of the, our uh, prestige people, singing it. And we went down at clubs in sort of Miami or uh, or uh, Chicago and when this track came on everybody went crazy and jumping around and waving their bottles around so it was actually a real real club anthem when, when, when you went there and uh, uh, but it was also involved and the involvement I said was all the way through the process we didn't have money to have big big campaigns everybody had to agree to agree I think it cost us about a hundred grand to uh, to give the money to uh, Def Jam Records to record it and write it and, and uh, uh, Buster Rhymes to get it we used up some of our money as a promoter in clubs like Club Night called Wazzy and Night, and this would hit off and start around, and everybody pass it around. Uh, but we didn't have a massive, massive, massive campaign. And uh, as I said, we'd uh, ever had other kind of club nights in other places, we'd try and make sure there was enough albums went there, and we had enough sort of peers from people who bust around, etc. And this worked because, as I said, uh, we went the right kind of people, we got them to, we agreed with what they wanted to do. Uh, and I know there's been a lot of problems about how you manage an artist if everything goes wrong, but we knew we were going in with a tricky bunch of people that things could go wrong, but also knew that were really smart business people. Didn't, they didn't want to mess it up. They were quite to be involved in it, and you had to use and work within the terms of the way that they wanted to work. And it work, worked for us. Uh, and, you know, Cobb was just doing, doing well now, and it did well in the clubs, and Buster Rhymes did, did very well as well. Just give you the rest of it, and... Uh, if I knew how to do it. It's a bit a little bit long, maybe not so loud. We can all get up and <laughs> <laughs> get in that. Uh, Show circuit, black in the box out. Don't open up the garage and pull the drops out. Fucking the fur coat in the blue box out. Yeah, the blue box out. Time to hold my crew now, son. Come on, get your ass up on the floor. <laughs> Your hands if you want to know. Oh. Baby, put me your crotch out and take away the way we the spot out. Come on, look how we got it ready to act out. Yeah, girl, ready to get the twist in your back out. Come on, drink it, yeah, till a nigga falling out. Let him his back now, watch yeah. the nigga crawl out. Yeah. Oh, what's up, son? What's up, son? Yeah. <laughs> 
So we had a whole year's work just like that, passing around on the club in the right places, the right people endorsed by the right people, involved with the right people. And it was tiny, tiny budget, but it did well. So did you go around all those years ever say thank you for all the sounds of this generation? Uh, they did, did very well in the States. In fact, uh, there's other, other things I've found as that, you know, this normal little brown, brownie bottle with a long neck. Most people in the States would drink it. There's a half bottle, flat one in your back pocket. <coughs> They also did sort of things like, well, once they realised that, they started making silver, little silver and gold uh, uh, metal bag things, which people hand it around and pass it around. So actually learned a bit about cultural differences and how to promote it, even with things like that. So actually it was, for them it was a very good learning show, how to sell to different, different people. And they did, and as I said, the, the other thing about so the sort of brown spirits, once you start making it, it takes you 10 years to change things. You have, you have to have good success, but there's only so many you make every 10 years. So you don't want massive success, you want managed success. But what you definitely want is to keep the price premium. So if you, if you can only make you know, 100,000 barrels a year, you want the more money you get for those 100,000 barrels, more important than trying to make up the 200,000 or 400,000. Vodka, you can make 100,000, 200,000, 400,000 per month. Brown spirit, it has to be a managed uh, growth pattern. But what you're trying to manage is the sort of price premium. So that's why a lot of the brown spirits are only for, for premium people, because you can't go hobby. Who owns the rights in the sun? Well, I've just looked that up. <laughs> quite, 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 what, what, what we did, we, we, didn't, we didn't want the rights in the sun, because if we went that, we would never gone anywhere. We would have involved it. French too much to explain what goes on here. Yeah? <laughs> uh, as I said, when the Americans got it, the French didn't get it that well. We just said, oh, we've got to do some activity, promotion was some scene. That's more or less how we did it. We'll need to have re record it. Special recordings we'll need to do. We, we pumped them the money. There's 13 registered publishing that. Because it's got <laughs> samples. Exactly. There's a lot of different people in it, you couldn't, read, you couldn't negotiate with them. Yeah, Def yeah. Jam Records did it because they're all massive list of all, all different songwriters. Yeah, Def yeah. 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 Jam Records sort of was able to do that. We just give them money, let them sort it out. We didn't want to come back for us, we just wanted to be able to use it and uh, get on with it. And that was a, another thing I've learned, is that sometimes collaboration, especially when I say, what do you do, you know, when you do merchandising as well, sometimes merchandising is giving money. Uh, you know, give them money for a thousand t-shirts or a million t-shirts, but expect to sell twice as many, but don't ask where they went to. That happened as well. Um, I have a question. Um, one of the main reasons for success was the fact that it was authentic. Yeah. Um, and nowadays people are much more kind of savvy about, you know, sort of collaborations and things like that. And I think can smell when something's inauthentic. Um, so apart from kind of getting in first, how do you well, sort that, of... Well, that's what made it authentic. We, did, yeah. we, we didn't think, oh, we want you, Mr. De Mr. Russell, to get that guy, uh, Buster Ranch, to write the track with our words in. We actually went and said, we've got this problem, we want to talk to your guys. This amount of money uh, you know, in the musical world, what do you suggest? He said, oh, I know a guy that... He's really good, he can write so tuna. All right, okay, let's, let's do that. Uh, and because he did that, he was able to talk to the music press and the sort of, the sort of select press and explain how it went. You know, we, we didn't commission him, mm -hmm. they, they commissioned themselves in a funny sort of way. I mean, he, he could have maybe got some of that as a street artist to do something. Yeah. I don't know, it was, it was, that, it was that loose at the beginning. Did we he knew already? as soon as they got something, we, can, we knew how to push it, get it to different uh, audiences. And did he already drink the product? He drank everything. <laughs> he drank everything. <laughs> and other stuff, of course. <laughs> Again, that was, I mean, I remember the French saying, well, what about you know, all this sort of defamation and all that? Just 
those were terribly unfortunate. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you.